In this episode, U Lethbridge neuroscience professor Dr. Rob Sutherland gets scientific with his talk, asking why is the brain important? The brain is the vehicle for all the qualities that define our humanity. It is at the center for all early development and learning, education, family life, social interactions, creative work, and creating knowledge. Understanding how the brain creates perception from sensation and generates action is key to understanding all human phenomena. So um, today I'm going to talk about a tale of two brains. And I'm going to tell the story backwards. Um, and really, it's a story about age-related decline uh, in cognitive function and uh, age-related dementias. Um, so um, a lot of the talk will be about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and what I want to do is to make the topic a little more poignant than just why is the brain important. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that um, everything we value about our identity, our intelligence, our emotions, um, our uh, ethical and social decision making, all of those things depend upon continuity and brain processes. Um, and the brain is the specific thing that connects us uh, to our parents, our children, our ancestors, our social network, um, and including our thoughts and continuity of thinking at the moment and our connection to an imagined future. That all depends on uh, brain processes having continuity. Age-related dementias represent a disease process that breaks these connections. It does so by dissolving a person very slowly, uh, reducing um, their cognitive performance due to meaningless cell death and meaningless generation of abnormal proteins. Uh, and ultimately, um, th the brain dies. So age-related dementias are going to define uh, as conditions characterized by progressive loss of cognitive abilities, reaching a point where the person is no longer able to look after themselves on a daily basis. They lose that ability. And, and at that point, um, they can be diagnosed with uh, dementia. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, we do see distinctive brain changes uh, that I'll describe for you. Um, and it's in Alzheimer's disease that we have two very specific proteins that are abnormal, that are generated by the person's brain, and that provide us with an opportunity, I think, in the future, to intervene and stop the disease process. There's also um, dramatic increases in inflammation uh, and impaired immune system responses occurring in the brain. So I imagine most of you, like me, uh, have a few questions that um, you'd like to have answered. One is, will I develop dementia? Do I have early dementia? How can I avoid dementia? And can dementia be cured? Um, very quickly, I'll tell you we can't cure it now. Uh, so that's an easy one to answer. Uh, we may be able to cure it in the future, and there's some very good directions. Uh, and I'll try uh, in the rest of the talk to answer the other questions. So my goals are to point to the current knowledge as of this month related to the most common questions that people have. I'm going to try to place all the risk factors that exist uh, or that we're aware of uh, into an overall context. And I'm going to point to the costs uh, in a global context as well. So first, the scope of the problem. Brain conditions are right now the leading cause of global disability, period. Um, and this has uh, uh, just been established in a paper that's coming out next week uh, in Lancet uh, Neurology. I think people don't appreciate that fact. Uh, we talk about disability of various types. Um, far and away, brain conditions are the most common. Age-related dementia cases um, with Alzheimer's disease being the most common one, will double in the next 20 years. And the costs are going to triple. 
Um, that's a staggering statistic. Right now, before this wave of Alzheimer's disease patients coming in, right now it's already more costly than heart disease and cancer combined. Uh, and I will say the amount of money that's spent on studying dementia is far less than the amount that is spent on trying to tackle heart disease and cancer. In the United Kingdom and in a few other European countries, dementia is the leading cause of death. It's ahead of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, Canada's a bit behind in recording. The UK has a really uh, mature uh, dementia strategy. Um, but I have seen data from the South Zone showing that it's now the second leading cause of death, uh, mainly affecting rural women. Here's um, um, a, a, a very important basic slide. This is um, age across the bottom of the slide, and then the, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease per 1,000 people. What you should see here is if, if you live long enough, you have a 50-50 chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. And we're living longer uh, as uh, cardiovascular diseases are better controlled, as cancers are, are actually um, put into remission, we will live much longer and we're in better general health. Um, and so we're going to live longer and age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and any other age-related dementia. From this slide, um, you can also see that it affects more women than men. Um, it's one of the few diseases that um, women suffer from uh, much more than men. Um, and I think that to underscore the, this problem for our, our, our health uh, system, I really doubt that Alberta has enough motel rooms for all of us. Um, people living with dementia um, exist at the convergence of four biases. Ageism, it is a disease of old age. Sexism, it's more women and particularly rural women. Um, racism, uh, non-white people are far more likely to develop a dementia uh, than white people. Uh, and ableism. Um, people in general um, have biases against people who show cognitive uh, problems. Um, brain aging itself uh, is an entire spectrum. Uh, so I'll show you an example of a, a very nice, uh, healthy brain from an 80-year-old. Um, and there's very little change in many people's brains with age. On the opposite end of the spectrum is massive cell loss, loss of neurons, uh, misfolded proteins that form plaques and tangles, um, and dramatic cognitive disability. And we can see everything in between uh, those two extremes. Um, the tale told backwards starts here. Imagine two people, both about 80 years old, who suffer heart attacks while at a picket pickleball match. Both die of cardiac arrest while en route from our city to Calgary because appropriate cardiac emergency care is not available in our zone. They both had arranged to donate their brains to a university neuroscience research repository. And here they are, Rob and Sonny. Um, so this is the start of the tale. Take a look at the brain on the left uh, labeled Rob. Um, that is, it, it looks like a middle-aged brain. Uh, it, it is uh, quite fat and juicy. Um, and um, in contrast to that, the brain on the right uh, has very large gaps between the ridges in the cerebral cortex, that outer part of the brain. Uh, it's quite striking. Um, and um, this person also showed marked cognitive impairment at the time of death. If we slice into the brain, we can see the brain on the left, Rob, with no Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that's the way the white matter and overlying gray matter look. Uh, very tight um, uh, little spaces between the ridges in the cortex. In contrast to that, 
the person with Alzheimer's disease shows dramatic shrinkage uh, of both white matter and gray matter. So the white matter is the connections between neurons, the gray matter are the neurons themselves. So there's a loss of neurons leading to big gaps between the ridges in the cortex. Uh, and there's big blank spots in the brain that represent the shrinkage of uh, both gray matter and white matter. In fact, that, um, that gap between uh, the ridges in the cerebral cortex uh, is actually the very best way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. You don't need fancy genetic tests or um, biochemical examination post-mortem. Uh, you can take an MRI and actually measure this. Uh, and you can identify 92% of uh, Alzheimer's patients using that uh, measure alone. When you look microscopically at the brain, uh, what you can see uh, in the top um, left of this uh, slide, um, you can see amyloid, a pathological protein, wrapping uh, the inner surface of blood vessels. Uh, so there's a vascular component uh, to Alzheimer's disease, and amyloid seems to deposit itself on small vessels. If we look at the bottom uh, right, you can see um, uh, big uh, processes coming out of a, a star-shaped thing at the top of the bottom right figure. Uh, and that's an amyloid plaque uh, that exists within um, white matter and gray matter. And then below that uh, are tau pathological tangles, the second abnormal protein in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so when you see these two characteristics, uh, it's uh, guaranteed to be Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is progressive. Uh, so uh, we start from um, having no cognitive disability. Uh, and this is where primary prevention um, uh, should be applied while we're normal without any symptoms of the disease. As we go into uh, pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, again, there's no cognitive impairment, but there are very clearly early brain changes. We can start seeing the pathological proteins and we can start seeing a bit of uh, shrinkage. The third stage is mild cognitive impairment. And this is where people start um, having people say, you know, you told me that story just yesterday and you're telling me again today. Or, or you end up walking out into the parking lot, hopefully you don't have to go too far, uh, to find your vehicle, and you're absolutely lost, and you sort of start circling around trying to find it, um, clicking to get a little beep noise. Um, mild cognitive impairment really doesn't interfere uh, with one's, oh, and don't develop neuroscience student disease. Um, <laughs> we all have these problems. Um, it, I don't, of course, but all of you have these problems, and, um, uh, and it's benign. I mean, age-related changes in the brain cause uh, all sorts of things, uh, slowing of reflexes, um, problems in vision, hearing, uh, and so forth, and including memory. Uh, so having a benign, uh, non-pathological um, memory impairment is quite characteristic of old age. Um, as we um, go a little bit further, uh, we get to mild and moderate and severe Alzheimer's disease, and here we have people who can't look after themselves, who need care in order to make it through a day. This slide actually shows um, a couple of important things. One is, so it's time along the bottom, uh, and it's um, the, uh, the extent of pathological processes. So the first red line that's going up there is actually amyloid deposition. It's pathological amyloid, that bad protein. It starts ramping up way before you show any symptoms. Um, and you wouldn't even know it was there unless you did a specialized test to find out uh, if amyloid is accumulating. Um, following that, you start seeing a ramping up of the green, which is the other pathological protein tau. That also starts before you show uh, clear uh, cognitive impairments. 
Um, people who are going to develop the disease uh, reach a certain threshold of tau and probably amyloid beta um, that starts causing loss of connections, loss of cells, interference with general brain function, inflammation, uh, and recruiting the innate immune uh, response in the brain. Um, not everyone who has amyloid beta deposition will become Alzheimer's. So they won't necessarily develop a disability. Um, and this has been amply shown in a number of studies. Probably the best one uh, is the Nunn study uh, by Snowden, uh, in which he actually had people uh, getting lots of testing through uh, old age. Uh, and he was quite startled to discover that many of the brains of nuns, and there's nothing in particularly uh, strange about nuns, but some nuns who had no cognitive impairment um, had a huge amount of amyloid plaque. So um, he was able to go back through the history of these people uh, and the people who really showed resilience in the face of amyloid beta uh, had a little bit better education. And if you look at their written language, it's far more complex and rich uh, in, in its form. So there's, there's a kind of cognitive uh, reserve that exists that confers resilience uh, to amyloid beta, um, but it can't overcome all the problems. Uh, this is the general pattern as you go from NC, which is a normal control in the study, um, where dark red is a lot of amyloid beta in the top three brains, normal control, mild cognitive impairment, has a lot of amyloid beta, especially in the frontal lobes. Uh, and then the person with uh, clear Alzheimer's disease is showing a uh, very dramatic spread of amyloid beta into many other regions of the brain. Uh, the same is true with tau, although it is recruited a little bit later in the brains of people with age-related dementia. Uh, but you can see its pattern is sort of similar to uh, the amyloid beta uh, deposition. Uh, and at the bottom, that's just the uh, general metabolism of the brain. Uh, the darker the blue, the less metabolism there is. And this is very typical in people uh, uh, living with Alzheimer's disease. They have very low brain metabolism. Um, this is just to remind me that um, vascular problems uh, in the brain are almost 100% um, going together with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that uh, MRI of a brain on the right shows white patches. Um, in the white matter. Um, these are white matter hyperintensities. Uh, all of us who reach a certain age uh, will show some little tiny white matter hyperintensities. But when you have vascular disease, you see these big patches in several different parts of the brain. So vascular problems are obligatory. The other thing that's obligatory, uh, this is um, a rendering of a kind of magnetic resonance imaging uh, that looks at uh, connections through the cerebral cortex. What you see in Alzheimer's disease is a progressive loss of connections, uh, especially very long connections from the front to the back of the cerebral cortex. Um, uh, connections are lost. Okay, here's the money section of the talk. Um, this is the life course risk factors uh, for dementia, especially Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the things that I'll talk about um, that are in green are late life factors, so my age. Uh, so these are factors that are relevant in the elderly. Um, orange are midlife factors, blue early life factors, and gray potentially unmodifiable factors. These are factors that we have no idea how to, how to modify. Um, it's also the case that some risk factors interact with age. Um, in one, um, that is interesting is that if you're obese um, using objective indices um, in early life and in middle age, you have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. In contrast to that, obesity in the elderly is actually protective. You actually have a lower um, risk. Um, so, so the curve is bimodal. I'm not encouraging you to overeat. Uh, it's very bad. Um, very bad for your heart. Okay, so uh, this is a summary of all risk factors. 
The unmodifiable ones are over in an almost invisible uh, dark square. 65% um, of the known risk is unmodifiable. We don't know how to change it. 35% is modifiable. So that's good news. Um, and, and so just to put that in some kind of context, um, if you look at the person to your left and right, and if the three of you uh, are likely, um, uh, based on the unmodifiable factors to develop Alzheimer's disease. So look at that person over there. Look at that person over there. If you respond to the modifiable risk factors, one of you will be saved. Okay. Later life risk factors uh, include smoking, um, which is, uh, I mean, it's just remarkable that people still use um, nicotine and smoke cigarettes. But smoking is the biggest risk factor that's modifiable in the elderly. Uh, and in the elderly, you can only modify about 15% of the total risk. So it's pretty small. So those of you who are thinking you're going to smoke right up until you're 85 and then start jogging, probably <laughs> too late. Depression is another risk factor that is very important. Depression needs to be treated. And if it's treated, the risk associated with depression goes away. If it's untreated, you end up uh, going further down the path to Alzheimer's disease. Inactivity, especially physical activity, um, physical inactivity is a very big risk factor. So almost any kind of physical exercise is extremely important. Um, cognitive activity is also important, but not nearly as important as physical activity. Walking, running, um, playing squash, pickleball, um, although watch out, and, um, and even curling um, <laughs> is, is very good. Okay, um, hypertension needs to be controlled. Uh, so there's lots of effective drugs now and lots of other kinds of activities you can engage in um, that reduce hypertension. It needs to be controlled. So you need to actually look up the guidelines. Don't rely on your physician necessarily. Look up the guidelines for your age and sex uh, and try to hit those marks. Controlling type 2 diabetes, so later life diabetes, extremely important. And finally, brain injury. Uh, so while you're playing pickleball, you don't want to fall down and bang your head. Or if you're curling, you don't want to fall on the ice and hit your head. Concussions in later life um, are actually a big risk factor. Okay, now we're going into midlife. And this has about 12% of the risk. And one of the ones, the biggest one in fact, um, most people are quite surprised about until all of the hearing commercials started um, online and on television. Uh, hearing loss that's uncorrected is the single biggest risk factor in middle age. Uh, so I got mine. Um, nearly everyone who reaches a certain age experiences loss of uh, hearing acuity, just like visual acuity. And it should be corrected. Again, hypertension. Now obesity shows up. Um, physical inactivity is still there. Uh, sleep disorders. Uh, so insomnia and other kinds of sleep problems. Uh, so if you uh, nap and then sleep four or five hours in the night, that's actually considered to be a sleep disorder now. Um, and so you want to get, you know, six to nine hours sleep uh, every night. And there's various things you can do that improve that um, and re would reduce risk. And then finally, brain injury is still there. Concussions and other kinds of uh, contusion injuries. We're into early life. And here, the single biggest factor is um, low education. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any bottom to this or any top to this. So um, completing high school but no post-secondary uh, uh, gives you bigger risk than if you completed some post-secondary. Um, and then if you complete some post-secondary um, compared to getting a master's degree, um, you have greater risk of Alzheimer's disease, and so forth. Um, 
education turns out to be a wonderful thing. Uh, and it's actually the increase in education that's responsible for the decrease in the rate of uh, dementia that's showing up in some European countries. Um, and so I think this is extremely important for us. We should be investing huge amounts of money, not only in cardiac care um, and motel rooms, but also in our public educational system. Uh, brain injury in uh, early years is also uh, very bad, as is physical inactivity um, in children. What about these unmodifiable risk factors? Probably nearly all of them are genetic variants uh, or um, uh, epigenetic factors that modify the expression of genes. Uh, and so probably all of you have heard about the Alzheimer's gene, which most people uh, call the APOE4 gene. That accounts for about 7% of risk. It's pretty big. Uh, and there's not really very much you can do about it. Um, if you have one allele, um, it increases your probability by quite a lot. And if you have two, um, it's additive uh, uh, as risk. And there's 43 other known gene variants that um, contribute to risk for Alzheimer's disease. And these are there from conception. All right, and it turns out we know what a lot of these genes do. And they cluster uh, into a small number of um, uh, functional categories. Uh, you might guess that some of the genes are involved in generating amyloid protein. Some of the genes are involved in generating tau protein. Um, and then as you go over to the right-hand side of this graph, the genes start becoming much more common in the population. Uh, and some of the functions related to these uh, are innate immunity uh, and um, various kinds of processes involved in inflammation. Um, the one that's right in the middle that's blue is the APOE uh, allele and it's involved in uh, lipid metabolism, uh, especially uh, certain kinds of lipoproteins. Okay, the clusters are amyloid, and we now have two monoclonal antibody drugs that have been approved in the United States. One of them has been approved in Canada um, that actually bind to amyloid and start clearing amyloid out of the brain. Um, it's promising, but it's not great. It, it's, it, it produces only a modest benefit uh, when it's applied. And it's unclear exactly why it's modest. My own feeling is it's because it's always applied too late. It's not applied when people are normal. It's applied when people are showing uh, mild cognitive impairment or, or even mild dementia. Uh, the tau protein, uh, another functional cluster for genes, is right now the focus of a lot of antibody therapy experimentation. Uh, they're trying to develop uh, passive vaccination uh, as a way of clearing tau. And for my money, tau is the thing that causes the loss of connections and cells, uh, neurons in the brain. There are genes connected to innate immunity, and there's one cell type in particular that's uh, quite aberrant, microglia. Uh, and a lot of work is focusing on trying to um, restore the normal function of microglia uh, in brain. And then the last one we know very little about is endocytosis, that's when cells gobble up debris in the brain. Uh, and that is the fifth cluster um, that can show uh, genetic variation. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about other smaller uh, risk factors that just are a list. Socioeconomic status is a big one. Um, the overall risk over the lifetime for people who are in uh, lower socioeconomic status is a twofold and perhaps even threefold increase in risk. Um, bilingualism or multilingualism is protective. We don't know when in life it matters, but we do know that if, if people become bilingual or multilingual as children, this is quite protective. 
Um, low red meat diet is protective. Uh, and there's various versions of the Mediterranean diet out there that confer uh, a protective effect. Uh, so not much red meat, uh, lots of fish and grains and vegetables and fresh fruit. Um, good sleep hygiene, I think I mentioned that. Avoid heavy drinking. So avoiding heavy drinking is protective. Glass or two of wine, it's okay. Um, but avoid binging and uh, regular heavy drinking. Um, vaccinations over the lifetime are protective. Um, childhood vaccinations all the way up to the annual um, influenza vaccine. Um, as you add up the number of vaccinations people have, there's greater and greater protection from Alzheimer's disease. Um, migraine with aura produces an increased risk. That's really unfortunate for me. Um, but it does uh, cause an increase in risk, probably because it, it contributes to the vascular uh, pathology that uh, is occurring. And then lastly, uh, air pollution. People who live near busy roads uh, have a higher risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementias as well. And noise pollution, uh, living in cities or uh, living near loud uh, areas of uh, a locale. So let's summarize the lessons from, and, and actually, it turns out that it's the, um, uh, for air pollution, most of it is coming from uh, brakes, uh, little uh, magnetic um, nanoparticles um, float out. And if you live by a busy road, you're inhaling them. And they pass right through uh, the blood-brain barrier. Okay, summing up lessons from the story tool backwards. I think we might imagine that brain health and aging is a matter of individual responsibility. To some extent it is, but the greater part of risk is not modifiable by the person who's aging. Um, and in fact, if we sum it all up, um, the person who stops smoking, starts eating healthy, and starts jogging late in life has already missed out on uh, most of the modifiable risk factors from early in life. Um, so we really do have to start applying the information um, from the story going backwards to mitigate um, overall risk. Again, I'm gonna say the majority of risks are now outside of our control. Um, and so we shouldn't be blaming people who show up with um, cognitive impairment in old age. And the rate of age-related age dementias is declining in some countries over the last few decades, almost entirely due to more education and less smoking. We haven't really seen uh, a global impact of any of the other factors. So uh, I'd like to make a couple of acknowledgements first to the people who organized this wonderful event. Um, Quite a turnout, the people who advertised it uh, did the local coordination here uh, to the Faculty of Arts and Science for sponsoring it and the Owen Holmes Lecture Series uh, who also sponsored it. Uh, my own funding uh, related to this work comes from the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and the Northwest Territories, a great organization if you feel like making a donation. Uh, it's a, a really great group. Alberta Innovates, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and thank you. This was our final Public Professor Series talk for the 2023-24 season. Thank you for watching. We will be back next year with another thought-provoking lineup.